فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه والتابعين لهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد we are in the explanation of the kitab al isbah fi bayan manhaj al salaf fi al tarbiyah wal islah written by al shaykh al allama Abdullah ibn Salih al-Ubaylan Hafizahullahu ta'ala Yesterday we took 10 qa'ida Ama 10 qawaid We took 10 principles Inshallah ta'ala today we're going to take another 10 principles Bi'idhnillahi al-bari Al-qa'idatu al-hadiyat ashara The 11th qa'ida Annahum they are Meaning ahl al-sunnati wal-jama'a Ya'taqiduna they believe Anna a'zamu asbab al-iftiraq أهل السنة والجماعة believe that the greatest cause of disunity it is هو التشيع والتحزب is sectarianism cult mentality towards what والتحزب بعض المسلمين some of the Muslims cultting being fanatic ila ta'ifatin towards a group or jama'atin or a group or shakhsin or towards a person they're a fanatic towards an individual ghayra rasulillahi that person is not the messenger wa sahabatuhu al-kiram and it is not the companions it is not the companions nor is it the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam so pay attention to this if you want to know what causes disunity, what is it? What causes disunity and brings about disunity is when people start to become groups. And that group are fanatic towards what their sheikh says. Our sheikh said this, khalas. This person that they are being fanatic towards is not the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Nor is it the companions as a whole. No. It's a particular shaykh. And you tend to find that in even some people who claim the sunnah, who will say to you, Ana ala aqidati ahli sunnati wal jama'ah. I am of the belief of ahli sunnati wal jama'ah. Who will say to you, I follow the kitab and the sunnah. They will say, they're fanatic towards an individual, a shaykh, a particular shaykh. Or a group of shaykh, fanatic towards them. As the poet said, إِذَا قَالَتْ حَدَامِي فَصَدِّقُوهَا فَإِنَّ الْقَوْلَ مَا قَالَتْ حَدَامِي Like if this shaykh says something, it's like it's a divine law. It's like a حُكُمْ شَرْعِ مِنْ قِبَلِ اللَّهِ It's like a law that came from Allah that has to be followed and adhered to. When in reality, the statement of the scholars are what? They require evidence and they are not evidence in and within itself. So this is the belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-An'am, Ayah 159, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيعًا لَسْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا Those who divided, um, disunity occurred between them. وَكَانُوا شِيعًا Pay attention to this word. This word shi'an keeps coming back in the Qur'an many times. What does it actually entail and what does it actually mean? In the religion, there are matters which we can differ upon. Are you saying that? Well, there are real things we can differ on. Like, for example, in the prayer, do you read the basmala loudly or do you not? Do you place your hand on your chest or on your navel? Or these are differences of opinion. When you go towards the sujood, do you put your knees down first or do you put your hands down first? These are masail which the scholars. Does your wife, does a woman break your wudu? Is a masala that the sahabas differed amongst themselves regarding. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud held the opinion that she does, even if it's your wife. Ibn Abbas didn't. Is a masala that we have difference of opinion amongst the sahabas. 
we might see one opinion to be stronger than another opinion. And that might be clear to you. You might think to yourself that that opinion of Ibn Mas'ud is incorrect. And that this opinion of Ibn Abbas is correct. That's what you might think. Or that's what you might believe. But it doesn't allow you in any way, form or shape to base love and hate on that. You then become a Shi'an. Masail which are not fundamental. The issues that are not fundamental. Basing love and hate on it is what makes a person Shi'an. The Prophet was told, Lest minhum fi shay. Are you with me, brothers? The criticism, pay attention to this. Al Jarhu wa Ta'deel, the criticism of a person, whether they are an innovator or not, it is from the Masail which are Ijtihadiyya. They are not from the Masail which are Usul and fundamentals. In the sense where if a scholar says so and so is an innovator or so and so is misguided, this is a Ijtihad from the Sheikh. It doesn't entail that every single person has to follow it. Are we, are we all together on that? Pay attention, Lakin. As Ibn al Qayyim mentions, the Masail, Allah, the Masail are very important that we understand it. If I come up to you and I say to you, Akhi, I saw so and so drinking alcohol, I saw so, I saw so and so drinking alcohol. This information, if I am reliable to you, and I am a person who is reliable, then I what? Then you take that. That's called the khabar. Because Allah said to you, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu in ja'akum fasiqum binaba'in fatabayyanu. If a person, so the opposite understanding is that if the person who has come to you is a reliable person, the person who has come to you, if it's a reliable person, then take what they t tell you. Are you with me? So you take it from me. Yeah, Ikhwa brothers. Amos here. So if I tell you that he drinks alcohol, what are you going to do? You're going to take that from me if you, if you see him reliable, of course. But what about if I say he's a fasiq? This is a hukum now. The information that I transmitted to you that he drank alcohol, you take that from me. That's a khabar. Allah commanded you to take that news from me. I'm informing you something. What I saw. But the ruling that I pass after that, which is that he's a fasiq, that's an ijtihad. You don't have to take that. And so many people who call themselves Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah today, they conflate between the two, they confuse between the two. Khabar and hukum. Khabar, you take that. As for the ruling that the person places on this individual, is an ijtihad. I don't have to take it. I don't have to agree with you on that. Are you with me, brothers? So, if you take the opinion of that shaykh and you choose to take it, and I see that the opinion of that shaykh is weak, I see that his hukum here is weak. I see that it's weak after my research. Are you with me, brothers? If you base love and hate on it, then you fall under inna ladina farraku deenahum wa kanu shi'a lasta minhum fi shaykh. You're basing love and hate on mas'ala which is ijtihadiya. So you fall under this verse. We find a group of people today who said to you, Shaykh Fulan said, Al Allama Fulan. And this person is a person of knowledge, Mathalan. And he said to you, he said. And you say, I disagree with him. By saying that statement, you leave the fault of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah according to them. This is a person who is bringing disunity amongst the Muslims on other than the statement of Allah and His Messenger. Can I not oppose the ulama if they get something wrong? If they oppose the Quran and the Sunnah? Where is the ayah? وَاتَّبِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا مِنْ دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَاءَ قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ I was commanded to follow unrestrictedly the Quran and the Sunnah. Are you with me, brothers? So many people get fooled in this particular matter. Some of the qiraat that has come regarding this ayah is إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَارَقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيعًا لَسْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ <coughs> Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah said regarding this ayah إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَارَقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيعًا لَسْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ He said, 
Allahir, what is apparent is and the ayat amma that the verse is is general, is generic. Fi kulli man faraqa deen Allah, it involves everybody who goes against the religion or opposes the religion or disconnects himself from the religion. And he opposes it. Allah sent his messenger with clear cut guidance. Wadin al and the religion of truth. So it can become apparent over all religions. And his legislation is one. There is no difference, and there is no, what do you call it? There is no difference. There's no khilaf in it, and there's no iftiraq. There's no differences in it. So the ayah shows us what, brothers? Because some scholars, they say, based on the ayah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَارَقُوا دِينَهُمْ That the ayah is talking about the kuffar. Why are you using this ayah for the mubtadi'ah? Are you with me? It means that the disbelievers who went against the religion of Islam. Ibn Kathir said, لا الظاهر أن الآية عامة This verse is general. It talks about the disbelievers and it also talks about any mubtadi', any innovator who goes against the Quran or the Sunnah. He goes under this ayah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَارَقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيعًا he took this opinion from who? He took this opinion from who? Al Ibn Jarir al Tabari, rahimahullah. Because Ibn Jarir took that. So, what do we take from this qa'idah? What we take from this principle, which is very powerful, that the biggest cause why you see the, the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah divided amongst themselves is, is this reason. We find that some group of Muslims are fanatic towards a particular individual. This individual is not the messenger. This individual is not what? This individual is not the companions. And so because of that, there has come, there has come this unity. There has come this unity. I'm going to now talk to you about a very summarized and abridged history of why the Muslims disunited. The story and the tarikh behind the disunity of the Muslims. Are you with me brothers and sisters? What you have to remember, or remind yourself inshallah ta'ala is when this earth was empty and it was dark and it was dull and the, the, uh, the revelation was absent from this earth, the people, of, the people were disunited. There were different religions. Within Christianity there were so many different beliefs. There was nothing that could bring the people together. And the only one, or the only thing that was able to bring them together was a divine law. Because as you know, the people's logic and their way of thinking differs. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Inni khalaqtu ibadi hunafa. The Prophet said, I created, the Prophet said, Allah said, Inni khalaqtu, I created ibadi, my slaves hunafa. I created my slaves in the natural disposition. وَإِنَّهُمْ أَتَتْهُمُ الشَّيَاطِينُ Then the shaytan came to them. فَاجْتَالَتْهُمْ عَنْ دِينِهِمْ Shaytan came and he took them away from their religion. وَحَرَّمَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ مَا أَحْلَلْتُ لَهُمْ And the shaytan made haram for them that which I made halal for them. وَأَمَرَتْهُمْ أَنْ يُشْرِكُوا بِي مَا لَمْ أُنَزِّلْ بِهِ سُلْطَانًا And shaytan made them associate partners with me in that which they, they had no evidence for. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ نَظَرَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ Allah then looked at the people of the earth. فَمَقَتَهُمْ عَرَبَهُمْ وَعَجَمَهُمْ إِلَّا بَقَايَا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ And then what Allah did subhanahu wa ta'ala is He let remain on this earth a group who were holding on to the revelation. Even that the shaytan came and swayed many and deviated them but there was a group who were holding on to the revelation. So this, the Sahabas, they lived. And how were the Sahabas like? They were holding on to the revelation. They were holding on to the statements of the Messenger, alayhi salatu salam. Abu Bakr's time came. The revelation was what was given most the, the greatest importance. Uthman came, Abu Umar came. The wahi and the revelation was given importance. Even Uthman's time came and something started to pop up. Views, strange of opinions were starting to come up. 
People started to voice things that were strange, that wasn't heard of before. Groups like the Khawarij were coming out, who were using the Qur'an, but then weren't using the Sunnah. This wasn't the, that which the companions were aware of. So the Sahaba started to see a people who only, only want to give importance to the Qur'an. Qala Allah, Qala Allah, Qala Allah. And they don't want to quote the hadith of the Prophet. وَلِذَلِكَ Umar radiallahu anhu at his time, nothing like that could happen. And everything was strict. The Qur'an was given importance in the Sunnah. And no one could speak outside that. One individual by the name of Sabir ibn Islin, he tried, to, he tried to go to the verses which were ambiguous. Ayat which were mutashabihat. So he came to the companions and he said, who knows what, what it means, what dhariyati darwa. Trying to what? Trying to open doubt in the hearts of the companions. So the story reached Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Umar requested and he asked if this man can be brought, he could be tied to the tail of a what? Of a horse, a donkey. And he could be brought to him. And so the man got tied with the camel, sorry, the horse or the donkey, and he was brought from Kufa and he was brought to Medina. When he came to Medina, Umar radiallahu anhu said, Who are you? And he said, I am Sabiq. He said to him, Are you Sabiq? Ha. He took his stick out and he beat him so much until his head bleeded, blood started to gush from his head. And then Sabiq said to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, If you want to kill me, and that's what you want to attain from this, فَقْتُلْنِ قَتْلًا جَمِيلًا Kill me a good kill. Stop hurting me like this. Do it nicely. Finish me off. But if what you're trying to attain from this is that you want me to repent from what I did, then I have repented a clear-cut repentance. I will never do that. Umar then said, okay. Umar then commanded him to be taken. Umar commanded him from him to be taken where? Umar commanded him to be taken and to be not spoken to for one year. No one's allowed to take anything from him. And Imam al-Darimi narrated this in his Muqaddimah, in his Sunan. So this is how Umar's time was. But what you can see is the time of when Ali ibn Abi Talib came, when the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib came, Ali ibn Abi Talib couldn't be like Umar. Ali's time, things started to change. The bid'ah now was getting much stronger than it was at the time of Umar. So Ali ibn Abi Talib one day said to a man, who has any questions? Ali said that. And then one man stood up and he asked him, just like Sabir ibn Islin, he asked an ayah from the ambiguous verses. Ali couldn't respond to him like Umar responded. He couldn't beat him. All that Ali could say was, Allah, may Allah kill you. Allah. Why didn't you ask that which would have benefited you? So Ali's power wasn't as strong and it wasn't as, 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 as powerful as the time of Umar. The reason is because the innovation was now becoming much more stronger and it was becoming much more uh, greater than it was at the time of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The reason is because the people were becoming distanced from the Nurul Wahi, the light of the revelation. Allah says in the Quran, Awaman kana maitan fahiyaynahu wa ja'alna lahu nooran yamshi bihi fil nasi kaman mathaluhu fil dhulumati laysa bi kharijin, laysa bi kharijin minha. So the people were dying out because of the fact that the revelation was there, was missing. Allah also says, wa kadalika, awhayna ilayka ruhan min amrina. مَا كُنْتَ تَدِرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا نَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ نَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا So the people were in that darkness. But the people of Haqq was in the light because of the revelation which they were holding on to. That early generation went, Umar's generation went. And also the great noble companions died. Until an innovator, a man of clear misguidance came. And this man is the earliest person who came with his disbelief. And then this came, became a trait and a continuous going was the man by the name of Al-Ja'ad ibn Dirham. Al-Ja'ad ibn Dirham was a man who he blew a filthy belief into the hearts of the people. Ja'ad ibn Dirham said, Anna Allah lam yukallim Musa taklima. Allah did not speak to Nabi Musa. 
وَلَمْ يَتَّخِذْ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا Allah did not take Nabi Allah Ibrahim as a close friend. So this is what Ja'ad ibn Dirham said. And Ja'ad ibn Dirham was a man who one day a group of deviated Indians from India came to him. When they came to him, they, they asked him, they asked Ja'ad ibn Dirham, who do you worship? And he said, I worship Allah. They said, can you, pre pre can you prove God's existence by your senses? Can you see, have you seen him? No. Have you smelt him? No. Have you tasted him? No. Have you felt? They asked these questions. Have you touched him? And when he said no to all of the senses and he said no, then they said, we don't believe in your God. So this confused him. 40 days he went away and he didn't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't pray one salah. And so what he did was he read through the books of philosophy. He read through the books of the Greek logians, what they wrote. And he brought that as an argument. This is where it first creeped in logic, coming in. Ja'ad ibn Dirham, qabbahahullah. He was, he passed this knowledge over to who? He passed this knowledge over to his student Jaham ibn Safwan. He passed it over to who? Jaham ibn, Jaham ibn Safwan. But Ja'ad ibn Dirham was killed by the leader of that time, Khalid ibn Abdullah al-Qasri. Khalid ibn Abdullah al-Qasri called the people and he said to the people, Oh people, today is a day of Eid. Eid al-Adha. All of you are going to go and you're going to slaughter your, your, udh, your udhiya. As for I, I'm going to slaughter, I'm going to slaughter Ja'ad ibn Dirham. So they said he stood up and he killed Ja'ad ibn Dirham. He said, yeah, this, is the, this is the khutbah that he did. He said, Ayyuhan nas, dahu taqabbala Allahu dahayakum. Go and slaughter. May Allah accept your slaughter from you. Fa inni mudahim bil ja'ad ibn dirhamin. For verily I am going to kill ja'ad ibn dirham. Fa inna uza'ama because he has claimed an Allah halam yukallim Musa takrima. He has claimed that Allah has not spoken to Musa. Walam yattakhid Ibrahim khalila. Ta'ala Allahu amma yaqulu al-ja'ad uluwan kabira. Then he left and he slaughtered and he killed him. Ja'ad ibn Dirham, his student Ja'ad ibn Safwan just saw what, he, what was done to his teacher. So this, they, they started to become silent. And this is one thing that you have to realize. The innovators are like, as Imam al-Barbahari mentioned, they are like scorpions. They bury their heads into the floor. And when they see, they think that at that particular moment that the power has been taken from them, the strength has been taken away from them. They are no longer strong anymore. What do they do? They become quiet. They pretend, they pretend that they're upon the Sunnah. They're with the people of the Sunnah. They will walk with the people of the Sunnah. When, we, when they feel like, okay, now we've got power. Our, the leader is listening to us. They, so what does the scorpion do? He buries his head into the sand and he keeps his tail at the outside. Whenever opportunity he gets, he... He kills and he, uh, he puts his venom inside the individual. And that's how they are like. So what happened was, they went quiet. But Ja'ad ja ibn Safwan, he was educating his students, teaching them. Until, until the first Al-Mi'ati Thalithati went. The third hundred went. The first three hundred went. And the leadership was taken by a leader by the name of Al Ma'moon. Ma'moon came and he took over. Ma'moon was an individual who liked different sciences, he loved different knowledges. And one of the knowledges that he started to like was philosophy, Ilmul Kalam. So he liked to look into logic, liked to look into the Greek logians, quotes, and things that they said. So he was the first person who asked. بتعريب كتب اليونان He said, can the books of the Greek logians be translated into Arabic? And so he was the first person who got the books from the, Arabic, uh, from the Greek translated into the Arabic language. And the, tra the transcribers and the translators started to work. And who would those translators be? The Jahmiyyah. Jaham ibn Safwan students. They're the ones who are you really want it to be translated? We're here, we're ready. They wrote everything they already wrote. Look how they were hiding it. 
They brought everything that they had together and the notes that they put together and they gave it to him. When they gave it to him, they started to whisper into his ear and they started to talk to him about it. So what did he do? He started to allow the bid'atul jahm ibn Safwan to spread in the Muslim world. And he commanded the people to follow this belief. And he punished the people based on it. But he didn't live for too long, Ma'mun. Who came? The one after him, his successor came, Al-Mu'tasim. When Mu'tasim came, he did not just stick to the concept of spreading it and allowed it, allowing it to spread. What he did was, he actually questioned everybody individually what their belief was regarding this. He was testing the people on it. He was forcing this belief down people's throats. And from the people who he tried to, th he tried to force it down their throat was who? Al-Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Imam Ahli Sunnati wal Jama'a. So he went to him and he tried to convince him and to convince Imam Ahmad to take it. But Imam Ahmad rahimahullah chose not to. And because of it, Ahmad was beaten and whipped to the extent Mu'tasim used to come from his palace and he would come to the prison and he would lash Ahmad himself. He wouldn't give it to anybody else. He would do it himself. The Jahmiya were at the back of the scene. They were the ones running everything. So what happened at that time? The people started to toss the textual evidences and push the te evidences aside. Taqdeemul ara'i wal uqul, the aql, the logic, the rationality, the mind was given so much importance and the sunnah was being fought against. And Imam Ahmed, at his time, some of the, some of the Salaf died because of this. From them, Abu Ya'qub al rahimahullah was killed. Nu'aym ibn Hamad al khuzai and others, they were killed, Shaykh al-Bukhari. They got killed this, in this fitna. They, stopped, they chose not to accept this deviant ideology that the leader was pushing. Allah made them firm, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they, some of them were not beaten, but they were promised that their money will be stopped. Because the government, they used to be paid from Baytul Mal and Muslimin. And they said, you can keep your money. And some of them died from hunger and, and lack of money. Naam. So this is my beloved brothers and sisters, when we, when we are so eager on these concepts of Aqeedah, we need to realize a people died for it. A people were bashed and they were beaten to the pole. For somebody to come today and to say these issues are trivial issues, they're la qibat, it's just difference of opinions. La. And make it look like it's nothing serious. When lives, when, 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 when uh, people were Ahmed and others, and Imam Ahmad suffered, suffered severely. Severely, rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'ah. Others like uh, Imam al buwayti and Imam al shafii as well. All of these people, were, the disbelief hurt them so much because of it. But guess what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tests. هذا من سنن الله. يحسب الإنسان أن يترك سدى. أحسب الناس أن يترك وأن يقول آمنا وهم لا يفتنوا. وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ Your iman has to be tested. You can't just say, I'm a mu'min, I'm a believer, and then, okay, that's it, mashallah, you passed the test. No. You say, I'm a mu'min, so oh, let's see if it's true, okay. And the believer is like gold. When you burn gold, it shines. It glows even more. It becomes more brighter. The believer is like that gold. The more he goes through hardship and he burns in the trials and the tribulations, the more he shines. The more his Iman comes out. And that's what Ahmed rahimahullah. Ahmed through this fitna, what did he attain? Yeah? Imam Ahli Sunnati wal Jama'ah. That's what he attained from that fitna. Look at him today. I'll tell you a story. And Imam al Dhahabi rahimahullah mentioned in Sir Alamin al that Ahmed when he came out from prison, and Imam Ahmed when he came out of prison, he became like the sun. Does anyone not know the sun? Ahmed's story and Ahmed's news reached Mashariq al Ardi wa Magharibiha, the east and the west. That one time, Baqiyat ibn Makhlid, you know who Baqiyat ibn Makhlid is? Baqiyat ibn Makhlid is min ayimmat al hadith al kibar, and he had the biggest Musnad, but his Musnad got lost. 
and he came from Andalus, and he di he went to directly to who Al Imam Ahmad. But the, by the time that Baqiyat ibn Makhlad came to Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Ahmad was in house prison. But Baqiyah showed love for Hadith to Imam Ahmad, and Imam Ahmad loved him when he saw him. That Baqiyah even said to Ahmad when he was in prison in the house. Ahmed said, I'm not allowed to teach. I'm not allowed to come out and I'm not allowed to talk to anybody. The leader has prevented me from it. The leader who's telling us the Quran is makhluq. Ahmed is still obeying him, still listening. He's not bringing about chaos. He's not, he's not rebelling against the leader. He's saying, Rahimahullah, Rahmatan Wasi'ah, I can't uh, teach. He said, Look, I'll do something. Baqir says this I'll dress like an old man. I walk to your house like an old man and knock on the door and you just give me one hadith a day. I'll listen to just one hadith. Imam Ahmed, just one hadith. Imam Ahmed used to give him one hadith. The point here is that Baqiyat ibn Makhlad got sick one day and wasn't able to come to Imam Ahmed's gathering. And Imam Ahmed asked the students, this was after Ahmed was given the rights and his, his rights was brought back for him. And the house prison he was taken off. So he said, where's Baqiyat? I haven't seen him today. They said he's sick. So Imam Ahmed said, okay, I'm going to visit him. Ahmed went and he visited Baqiyah. Baqiyah had a, you know, back in those times, just like today, when a person comes to a city that he doesn't, is not his own hometown, what happens? He has to what? It's like a hotel. You go to a hotel because you don't have nobody in that city, right? You go to, for example, uh, uh, Canada. Generally, you're just going to get, get yourself a hotel. So what happened was that he made, he, he got this little hotel place. So that's where he was staying. Ahmed went and visited him. The owner of the hotel, I mean the owner of the, we'll call it a hotel right now, he didn't know Baqiyah at all and who he was. But what he saw was Ahmed outside the hotel. And he saw a, Ahmed comes out, everybody's going to come out with Ahmed. It was a stampede. Every single, the whole place was, the whole hotel was crowded. So the owner came out and he said, well, is, this, is the leader in this He's thinking that the, the lead of the Muslims is here or something. This is not a normal, it's a stampede. So he said, who, who's, who, who's here? He said, Ahmed. Ah, oh, okay. He's kissed Ahmed Muhammad. He said, how are you Imam Ahmed? How's everything? Allahu Akbar. And he said to Imam Ahmed, um, who, who, who did he come for? And he said, I came for Baqiyat ibn Makhlad. Uh, he lives here and uh, he's sick. He said, do you know Baqiyat ibn Makhlad? He said, yeah, I know him. Ahmed gave Baqiyat al Makhlid to see how he was doing, found that he was a bit ill, and he left him. Baqiyat said, ever since that day, the owner of the hotel used to look after him, take care of him, feed him. You know, the money and the funds used to reduce it from him. What I'm trying to get from that story is Ahmed Sara Mada. Ahmed, because him, people honored. But why did he gain that? As Allah said in the Quran, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا Ahmed became an Imam. But when did Imam Ahmed become an Imam? Al Imam Ahmed became an Imam when he truly showed patience and certainty.